So I'm, I'm, thank you. Um, so my name is Bassam. I'm uh, going to be talking today about a project called Rook and how it helps Ceph run on Kubernetes. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, there we go. That's, that's a lot better. Okay. So I wanted to start by talking about Kubernetes. Um, who's been playing with Kubernetes here in the crowd? Okay. Who's deployed Kubernetes in production? Okay. That's, that's a, about the, the rate I expected. Um, so, so what's Kubernetes? Um, there are a lot of people that describe it very, in very different ways. You hear container orchestration, you hear resource management, you hear an abstraction layer, many different uses of Kubernetes. I like to think of it as it's a cluster operating system. Um, essentially, a way to run modern cloud-native applications on multiple nodes and treat all those nodes as if they were one. That's a, probably the, the closest thing I can think of um, when I think when I describe Kubernetes. And so it has its application model. You deploy your apps in containers. You, um, they're very dynamic apps. They're scheduled. They're, you can declaratively define how, where they run. Um, Kubernetes provides all the resource scheduling, lifecycle management, essentially allowing you to horizontally scale your apps, um, automate things like rollout and rollback, um, service discovery, and a lot of other services that Kubernetes provides. And so, um, so, so again, if you think of it as this is a modern cluster-wide operating system, writing applications that run in this operating system uh, is a desirable thing. And Kubernetes has actually been getting a ton of momentum. It's now literally everywhere. All the public cloud providers support Kubernetes, have some form of a managed Kubernetes service. Um, all the distros, even Docker, is now running Kubernetes. So it's definitely gained a ton of momentum, and it's, it seems like it's here to stay. And so if we were to look at how, if you had stateful applications that are running on Kubernetes and they wanted to consume storage, Today, the story is Kubernetes runs, you know, the mostly stateless applications. If they use storage, Kubernetes reaches out using a common interface, whether it's CSI or dynamic volume provisioning, to a storage provider, a cluster of some sort. So Ceph is obviously one of those. Um, if you're running a Ceph cluster, um, you know, in whatever way you've deployed and managed stuff, um, then Kubernetes can actually consume through CSI or through the dynamic volume provisioning, can consume storage that's provided by that cluster. What's interesting about this is that if you look at Ceph itself, Ceph it's, is a distributed application. It is software-defined storage. It's highly scalable. It's horizontally scalable, um, yet, most common deployments of Ceph today in service of Kubernetes essentially don't, are, are completely independent. So you're running a Ceph cluster using whatever tools you're, you know, things like Ansible or, you know, relying on systemd or Ceph deploy or, you know, classic SSH and bash scripts or, uh, or even things like salt stack or, you know, it, many different ways that Ceph can be deployed today. Um, so one of, one of the things that motivated the Rook project is why not run Ceph on Kubernetes? Ceph is a, you know, dynamically managed, this is a horizontally scalable application itself. Why couldn't we run Ceph well, really well, on Kubernetes? And actually, there's a flip side of this question, which is, is Ceph better on Kubernetes? Can Ceph gain additional features to make it even more dynamic than it is today when it is running on an environment like Kubernetes? So that's the motivation for the project called Rook. Um, so I, I, Rook essentially makes Ceph awesome 
on Kubernetes. That's, that's the premise of, of Rook. So what is Rook? Rook is a cloud native storage orchestrator. So it's not, it doesn't actually, it's not a storage engine itself. It's not software defined storage. It is an orchestration layer for storage systems. So it extends Kubernetes, it adds essentially new types and controllers that help run storage systems on Kubernetes. Right now, Ceph is the only uh, storage system that Rook orchestrates. There will be more coming. Um, and, and Rook automates deployment, bootstrapping, configuration, provisioning, essentially all the things that typically either a person is doing or you try to encode in scripts or in you know, whatever playbooks or whatever you're doing. Those things are in, you know, now captured in code as part of controllers. And not, these controllers are not a one-time action. You just don't, it's not about a deployment. They're actually uh, sitting and watching the system and continuously making changes to the system to make it run well. So it's, it definitely has a runtime aspect and we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover what that means in a little bit. Rook's open source and it's currently hosted by the Cloud Native Foundation. Um, so it's, a, it's a pretty much an open project um, and, and part of this whole cloud native movement that's, that's underway. So I didn't venture to do a demo uh, today, but I'll, I wanted to show you kind of what Brook can do. Um, so this is the closest I can get to a demo. Um, so let's actually, if we were to deploy a new Ceph cluster on Kubernetes, um, here's a sample YAML that you could run. So on, on the picture on the right, Rook is actually running. If you were to tell Rook through Kubernetes that you wanted to deploy a very basic, very basic Ceph cluster using all the nodes, using all the devices, um, you can set things like device filters and metadata devices, but now I'm ignoring all of those. And you were to run that um, through kubectl on Kubernetes, Rook will take it from there, deploy the mons, get them to form a quorum, set up all the OSDs, init all the disks, um, essentially get a basic cluster up and running with Ceph. And it does that and is continuously act actively monitoring and watching the cluster itself. If you were to add another node, given the, the criteria here of using all nodes, Ceph will automatically provision that, Rook will automatically provision that node to you know, ex essentially extend the cluster. If one of the mons was to go down, uh, Rook will automatically provision a third mon uh, and reestablish quorum. It has a control loop that is actively watching and managing the system, which makes it a little different from most other approaches to deployment and management of such systems. So it, it's actively sitting in a loop. And that's the term we use as, a, as an operator, but it's also called a Kubernetes controller. So if you have a Rados cluster up and running, then you can do things like create a file system. Um, and that's also a very, very simple act. You define declaratively what you want as part of the file system. And then um, you post that, and then Rook actually goes and creates the MDS. Uh, servers, and now you have uh, CephFS available. And the same is true if you were to uh, create, if you wanted to create an object store using RGW, um, you essentially define the object store, you set all the parameters you want on it, the port, which nodes to use, the kind of interface you want to expose, and you post that, and um, Rook will go and create all the RGW proxies, set up service endpoints, configure them, um, and get that all up and running um, and actively watch it. So as I was talking, Rook is essentially an operator. The other term is controller. People use them interchangeably. Um, so the, the YAML that you saw is a declaration of desired state. It defines what 
you want to happen in the system, not what is actually out there. So it's a high level declaration of the, the intent of the operator or the intent of the cluster admin on what they want in their cluster. And you do that with objects like storage cluster, pool, object store, file system, and others. And then what uh, the Rook operator does is it sits in a reconciliation loop, essentially looking, observing what is out there and diffing what's out there with the desired state. And if there are differences, it will act on them. And that is running continuously. It's fairly efficient, um, but it's actively watching the system and reconciling desired state with actual state in the system. Rook is not on the data path. It's essentially you know, on the control path. It's doing lifecycle management of the daemons. It's not anywhere in the data path. It's the, the data path is classic Ceph. Your clients are talking directly to the, the OSDs and the MDSs and the, uh, the RGWs. There is no change to the data path at all. And as I mentioned, Rook itself is implemented as a Kubernetes extension. It has no persistent state itself. All its state lives in Kubernetes, which in turn lives in etcd. So it's not, it's not another component you have to manage itself. It is truly built as an extension of Kubernetes. If you're already running a Kubernetes cluster, you're, you can get Rook up and running with no additional changes. Um, and on the, you know, on the, uh, Rook has a, a, a essentially a, a volume plugin. It's, a, it's based on flex volumes. We're switching to CSI going forwards. Um, and the idea there is that th this is a client side component where it'll help you uh, consume the storage by, by essentially mounting the right volumes on the client side. So fairly straightforward. Kubernetes-centric architecture. And so one of the things that comes up is the division of labor between, say, what Rook is doing and what the Ceph daemons are doing. So I try to kind of explain what I think is the division of labor here. So if you think about data management as one direction, things like Mon and OSD and even Ceph Manager are managing data. Right, so Mons and OSDs are doing recovery and backfill and rebalancing and everything else. And actually, the manager is now doing a rebalancing. All of that stuff is around data management. Rook and Kubernetes are around the management of daemons. They are about managing the life cycle of these daemons and making sure that they're running and healthy and scale. And when the cluster grows, that they're creating new daemons, et cetera. The new Ceph manager model that showed up in Luminous is probably straddling both worlds. And in fact, there will be uh, interesting scenarios going forward where the manager is talking to Kubernetes and, and, and Rook to influence changes as part of uh, you know, essentially scaling a cluster or doing more interesting things in, in the cluster. So Ceph could start managing itself or having life cycle management of itself, which I think is a very interesting direction for, for Ceph. Um, and actually one where I think Ceph can get a lot smarter, and this is why I would advocate going forward that Ceph on Kubernetes is going to be super awesome. Uh, it is now and it'll be, it'll be even more in the future because of, of these kinds of interactions. And so let's go back to the, the use case. If you're running a Kubernetes cluster and you wanted storage, you could go create a dedicated storage cluster now on Kubernetes, which means that the surface area for management, the tools you're using for management, the, the uh, training that you have to do is essentially all the same. You're running Kubernetes on both sides. It just happens that you have an application on the right hand side that's Ceph that's providing storage or a probably a more interesting scenario going forward is uh, a converged solution where you can run 
Ceph among, among all your other applications. So this is a, essentially, in this scenario, there are containers here that are consuming storage, and then there are containers that are providing storage, and it all just works. Um, you have to be careful in these scenarios, resource management and, uh, uh, and, and essential policies have to be carefully managed here, but it is truly possible for, for you to actually run completely converged on something like Kubernetes today. And so I, I want to leave with essentially a, an aspirational goal. Um, I, I'd say, I, I'd like to ch challenge us to say going forward, we should always be running Ceph and Kubernetes and that should become the default deployment um, of Ceph. Um, that uh, we would normalize as a community on Ceph, on Kubernetes, and stop thinking about the, all the different ways of running Ceph today uh, on, on anything else. And so if, you're, if this sounds interesting and you want to get involved, uh, Brook is an open project. Uh, we're actively looking for contributors. Uh, please come help. We're a very happy, healthy community. Um, here are all the links. To, I advise you to you know, come join the project. Slack is a good place to find a lot of people that are building around this. Um, there's forums and there's community meetings every, every couple of weeks on Tuesdays. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Oh, and I, I have, I, I brought some stickers if you guys want some Rook stickers. I'll put them here. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm very interested in Rook project. Uh, I have tried uh, Rook in my Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, so I have a question about uh, performance loss. Uh, in fact, uh, I haven't. I haven't seen any uh, data or uh, test data about uh, rock, rock uh, in performance loss if we uh, if we use con uh, container container itself. So if if uh, could you could you could you introduce some about that? And yeah, there there really have not been a lot of performance testing of Ceph on Kubernetes that I'm I'm aware of. I think that's about to start. Um, the one that comes up a lot is networking, because Kubernetes has this funky networking, overlay networking. Um, Rook allows you to turn that off. You could run a cluster on the host network and avoid all this networking. But I, I think it's still, you know, we're, the, the community has to start looking at performance uh, more seriously on this. But, it, you know, I've actually not, I've not, besides networking, I'm not aware of any other issues that should get in the way in terms of performance. Uh, another question that I concern very much is that uh, uh, is it uh, stable, uh, stable enough of uh, Rook uh, used in produce environment? Use, uh, you know, uh, as I see that uh, uh, Rook now in um, 0 0.7 Oh, uh, not not a one point uh, zero version. So that and so so, how um, do you think uh, it's uh, it's uh, reliable to use it in, pr in produce environment now? Um, it's def it's still an alpha. There are some. I, I'm aware of tens of production deployments. I'd advise if you are going to put it in production, you should not only be comfortable with Ceph and doing using Ceph and going stepping outside of Rook and using Ceph directly. Um, but also be comfortable with making code changes in Rook um, if you're going to do that today. Um, you know, Ceph is production ready, has been for many years. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, Rook is not on the control path, so is not on the data path. So from that perspective, it seems, you know, Rook, Ceph is very much ready, but there are always cases, and we just ran into a couple, one case where I, Brook was doing something nasty to the volumes, and and so so, I expect Rook to be production ready in the next six months. So um, we're working towards that goal. There, you know, it'll probably go to beta on some of the types in the next few months. 
and then over over that period we'll we'll get it to production ready. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I have seen some open source projects uh, like uh, deploying Ceph with use Docker. And uh, I want to know what's the difference between use, uh, deploying Ceph with Docker or Kubernetes, and uh, which prefer? Thank you. So um, certainly you can deploy Ceph on Docker. You, Ceph can go into containers. I think the primary difference is that on Kubernetes you have an active controller that is managing Ceph. Um, so Ceph can be a lot more dynamic and actually a man it's, it starts to look like a managed Ceph on Kubernetes and that's the primary difference. If you run it on Docker, you're essentially having to do a lot of the things manually yourself still even though it's running in containers. There is yeah. So you mentioned about uh, data rebalance. Like, does it mean that auto scale? Like, if we hit some threshold, like 60% uses of the cluster, it will auto scale. Th those are very interesting uh, uh, scenarios. So, so one of the things that Kubernetes will allow you to do is do horizontal scaling, yep. and that could be based on a policy. So, you could do something like, as the number of connections go up on, say, a Rados gateway, yep. or uh, if there are health metrics that are exposed, and that could be a feedback loop to growing the cluster itself. Um, yeah. That those are those are yet uh, more examples of what I, why I think running Ceph in a dy dynamically managed environment like Kubernetes is going to help the project. Thank you. Yeah. Still questions? If there is no questions, here comes the end of the conference. Thanks for attending.